Good morning. Welcome to Cadora's Church of the Brethren. I have a number of announcements to share with you. If I can get them all together here. First of all, thank you, thank you for the blood drive. Uh, we had a blood drive this past Monday. There were 37 people came out, 32 able to donate, which is really awesome. Uh, we will be able to help 96 lives. 96 lives will be saved, they said, due to the donation. So thank you for that. There's an article in a newsletter from the Deacon Body entitled Staying Connected. Uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, just want to highlight a few things in it. We encourage you, along with us, to reach out to those you haven't seen in a while. We real realize that an in-person visit is not encouraged at this time, so reach out with a phone call to let someone know you miss them and care about them. Uh, a call can really brighten someone's day. We also had to make the tough decision to cancel our love feast and feet washing this fall. Uh, we will be having communion during our October 4th morning worship service. We'd love to pray for you and help you in any way that we can. Please contact either Pastor Ben, myself, our office manager, Christy, or Pat Markey, who has, who's in charge of our SOS uh, program or ministry, uh, if you have any uh, needs or requests. Uh, planning ahead for our next service Saturday, this is a little bit different uh, than what we've been doing. Uh, it's not going to be a service Saturday. It's going to be a service Monday. I'm in need of help to load a U-Haul trailer for a member that's moving out of the area. Monday, September 14th. Uh, again, I realize those of you who work, uh, that would not suit, but I, I do need some help. Uh, if you're retired and able to help uh, load a U-Haul, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, there is a barbecue fundraiser. Uh, that's going to benefit Jill and, and Tyler Dayhoff, uh, scheduled for September 19th. Uh, you're asked to call either Wayne or Sharon Schweitzer. Uh, tickets are $25 for dine-in, or uh, with COVID, $20 for carry-out curbside. Uh, it's going to be held at the Bill Schweitzer Farm in Seven Valleys. Uh, the event is from 2 to 6. So if you're interested in a barbecue, uh, please uh, contact either Wayne or Sharon. What's that date? What's the, date? Uh, the date is September 19th. Uh, gifts discernment team. Sorry, I have way too many papers here today. <laughs> uh, gifts discernment team is looking for a person willing to serve or persons willing to serve the church in a few capacities. Various positions are opening and will need skills that you have. If you have any questions regarding these opportunities to serve, questions as to what is expected in the position, please see either Jimmy Innerst or Leroy Keeney. Cadoris is a church based upon volunteers. Most of the work that is completed within the church is done by volunteers. Most of the outreach of the church is done by you, the volunteers. The services are planned in cooperation with you. The service Saturdays are planned by our pastor and carried out by you, the volunteer. In this time of imposed restrictions, the church has to map new paths to provide means of spreading the gospel. I ask that you consider being a part of this new future here at Cadoris. It's very easy to look around and say, not me. This is the time for you to engage with your friends and help lead Cadoris into the future. It's an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and your talents and your commitment to God through service to him. Again, please contact either Jimmy Innerst or Leroy Keeney or the pastors. And lastly, sorry, found way too many papers. Uh, in two weeks on Sunday, September 13th, you're invited to share in a celebratory opening of our Sunday schools. Join us from 8.30 to 9 for a time of celebration and at 9 o'clock for the Sunday school hour. Uh, using CDC guidelines, we'll have all classrooms open for your participation, so plan now to attend. Uh, that concludes the announcements. Uh, we'll now have the prelude. <laughs>
Brothers and sisters, we gather this day hungry for God's word. We also long to know God's love. We search for truth and wholeness. Let us now come before the throne of God with open hearts, eager and willing to worship the one true God. Please pray with me. Loving God, we come to you in praise. We come to you in humility and we come to you in hope. You alone are our promised land, our house with many rooms, our refuge, and our strength. Be with us today. Pour out your grace, which sustains us beyond measure. Speak a word to us today, so that all who gather here would trust your mercy and your power. Help us to focus on you and you alone as we worship here today. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is hymn number 12, Come Let Us All Unite to Sing. Please feel free to sing along. Please sing. Amen. God is love. We are now at our time that we're actually going to present our college and high school graduates from the class of 2020. We'd like to apologize that this didn't happen sooner, but we tried to do it sooner, and the pandemic kind of messed up our plans. And then the summer took over, and here we are. And due to when we're doing it, unfortunately, not many of our graduates could be with us this morning. The church is giving the high school graduates Bibles with their names on them, um, and also uh, the, the youth group actually is giving the high school graduates blankets that have, um, thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path, um, embroidered on them. The college graduates are getting a gift from the church that is a book by, by Matt Chandler called Explicit Gospel. So that uh, will be their next reading assignment now that college is over. 
So we're going to present to you them today. Unfortunately, I believe only one of them is here. So, um, so we will call her up when her name comes along. But what I'm going to do is a little bit of a newsletter tease. You see, we have a newsletter that comes out every month, all right, and has a lot of useful information in it. And the newsletter has the full graduate biographies, like details about what they did uh, in their education and what their future plans are. But for the ones who are not here, I will sum up um, where they graduated from and what their future plans are. And for the one that is here, I'll read her full bio. All right, um, so out of high school, from Spring Grove High School, Brandon graduated from Spring Grove. And actually, he is now a freshman at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia, and his major is going to be film. He's already down there at Liberty. He's been there for a little while already. Dalton graduated from Dallas Town High School. Uh, Dalton is currently seeking employment, which has been tough for him during this, these times of the virus. Uh, Derek also graduated from Dallas Town High School, and his future plans are involving going right into the workforce, is how he worded it. Kelsey graduated from Central York, and she is currently at Messiah College starting her freshman year, majoring in nursing. Garrett had to work this morning, so he is unable to be with us. He graduated from Dallas Town High School, and he is majoring, he's majoring in environmental systems engineering and minoring in biology, and also playing soccer for Penn State York. So that is where he'll be for the first two years. Our college graduates, Lisa graduated from Millersville University um, with a master's degree in social work, and she's currently employed by Wellspan Health as a social worker at Adams Cancer Center. That brings us to our graduate that's here today, Maddie, come on down. <laughs> Maddie is the daughter of David and Carol, granddaughter of Jim and Ruth and Don and Marlene and Jean. She graduated from Westchester University with a Bachelor of Science degree in early grades preparation and minors in both special education and literacy. This fall, she will begin her first year as a sixth grade language arts teacher at Eastern York Middle School. And she plans to get married to her fiance, Tyler, who is back there as well, in June of 2021. Also, if I didn't see you and you are here, please stand up, okay? But I don't think anyone else is here from that. Uh, Brianna's the next graduate. Uh, Bria graduated from York College of Pennsylvania with a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing and she plans and is already working at York Hospital on a medical telemetry floor. Erin graduated from Stevenson University which with a Bachelor of Science degree in film and moving image and a minor in graphic design. And she is currently editing wedding videos for a company called Artistic Difference and she's also building her independent film and design career. Tristan graduated from the Air Force Academy with a major in biology and a minor in Chinese, and she is going to be attending John, Johns Hopkins for her master's in nursing. Caitlin graduated from Northampton Community College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and her goal, uh, oh sorry, her degree, it's actually the longest degree I've ever seen in my life, the, the name of it, Associate of Applied Science Hospitality Management Meeting and Event Planning and her goal is to pursue a career in that field. So that are, those are our 2020 graduates. Another round of applause for their, their work and their efforts. We are always excited to, to acknowledge them. And my challenge to you as a congregation is reach out to them. Let them know you're proud of them. Um, you know, start a conversation with them and, and just let them know that, that we care. Uh, so. We're happy for them this morning. We're entering now into our time of prayer requests, and I have a few to share with you. So those are our prayer requests today. Um, if you do have one that wasn't mentioned, you'd like me to share it, come up while Pam's doing her uh, call to prayer, Pam and her sister Kathy.
Thank you, Pam and Kathy. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day and this chance to come together and worship in this place. We rejoice for cooler temperatures this morning that provide relief from, from muggy humidity, humidity and the hot sun. Uh, we, we thank you for, for gifts like that. And when we have a week full of hot temperatures, we're reminded of how fortunate we are and how much of a blessing it is to have relief from that heat. May that be helpful in reminding us how thankful we should be for something as simple as air conditioning, something that 30 or 40 years ago even maybe wasn't as much of a commodity. Lord, we're so blessed, we're so lucky. We, even when we feel like we're poor in this nation, we're so rich compared to other nations. We are, we are the rich ones that, that Jesus talked about in the gospel. Lord, may we have compassion on those who are not as fortunate as us. May we share our resources. May we, may we model our lives after Christ who gave his all for, for those who he loved. He gave his all for those who hated him. May Christ be our model. God, we thank you for, for those who you've brought to this place today, Lord. We're thankful to to be a part of your kingdom, to proclaim your truths. And Lord, I pray that you would guide this service to continue doing that this morning. God, we pray for our nation, for the division that exists among it, for, for the fights that take place over any single little thing or big thing. It's just no one can get along. Everybody fights, and we just pray for your help because we need it. Peace is a miracle right now, I think. It, it really is among among the nation, among people, among coworkers, among church members too. We just pray, Lord, for your peace. We need your help. God, we also pray for Kadorsh Church as we make some decisions too about the future. We pray that you would lead and guide the church, uh, the leadership team as they meet on Tuesday uh, for, for, for this whole church. Um, as the church works together at decisions that need to be made. God, we thank you for your beauty, the fact that we can look around, and we've said it countless times, this, this beautiful valley, and see the evidence of your handiwork. Lord, that we can marvel at the so nearly impossible chances that this earth would exist and that we would exist on it. We can marvel at the biology of our bodies and how they function. And all of these things, Lord, point to you. All of these things show us how glorious and how wondrous you are. May we worship you with awe and may we know that you are the one who is in control, that you are the one who is the creator. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Our hymn is number 337. So please stand and worship. Where were you on March 8th, 2015? <laughs> How many of you have any idea where you were? March 8th, 2000, does this stand out to anybody? Okay. It really, it shouldn't, other than it was a Sunday, so, you know, there's a good chance that maybe you were here that day if you were attending Cadoris at, at that time. Um, we were in the middle of a snowy winter because the two Sundays prior to that, we had canceled church due to... Uh, the snow and the cold, and because of that, we were in the middle of a James series, because of that, James 3, 1 to 12, got canceled, and that's a popular word these days, right? It got canceled, okay? But I tried to sum up James, 12, James 3, 1 to 12, really quickly on March 8, 2015, before I got into what the, that week's sermon was actually about, and I did it with some toothpaste. Does anybody, oh, Judy remembers that. Does anybody, who remembers the toothpaste? Okay, uh, you, some of you might remember, some of you, you might not. We're gonna do an express version of that today, okay? So I have Dwayne up here, all right? And I want you, Dwayne, to, um, I'm gonna time you, all right? And we're going to see how quickly, maybe you want me to hold the plate for you. Well, should I hold the plate? That'd probably be helpful. I'll hold the plate for you. Um, and we're going to time him to see how quickly he can squirt the contents of that toothpaste onto this plate. I see Tom back there, the property team chair. Don't worry, we'll keep it off the floor. <laughs> uh, we hope. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Three, two, one. Ooh. Okay. You, you feel like you're done? Okay. That was like eight seconds. All right, see that pile of toothpaste? Everybody, it's pretty obvious. I, thought, I forgot that it's uh, turquoise. It's, I thought it was white. I'm glad it's turquoise or whatever color you call that. Now, Dwayne, oh. I'm going to time you again. So that's eight seconds. All right, here's a fork. Oh, wait, you want this too. I want you to, I'm going to time you, see how long it takes to put it back in. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're already at eight seconds. Um, let's just see how long. We'll, we'll go 30 seconds and see how much he gets back in there. Are you trying hard enough? Keep I'm, trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Why don't you give me a fork? <laughs> what do you want, a spoon? <laughs> a 
A straw? A straw. <laughs> Actually, a straw is what I did a couple years ago. Okay, that's 30 seconds. All right, all right, very good. Let's clap for Dwayne. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, I'm going to put this over here. To remind you about that, obviously, the main observance of what just happened there is that it was a lot easier for it to come out than it was to go back in, right? Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to pray as we get into our, our sermon today. Father God, I thank you for this chance to, to share your holy word. I thank you for this opportunity to, to preach. Uh, Lord, it's a, it's a blessing to be able to do that and and I thank you for giving me that, that platform. Lord, um, I know that you can make good things out of our junk. So I just pray that you would take these words that I've attempted to put together to make a message um, to work in the hearts of people. And that's you doing it, Lord. That is you working in us. May, may you work in big ways this morning as we continue talking about what we talk about. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we continue our What Are You Saying sermon series, we remember that as Christians, we have a high calling in how we use our mouths, in how we talk. And so that brings us into the book of James today, the probably most well-known passage about the tongue. James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and in chapter one, James kind of gives a little preview of what he's going to talk about in the rest of the book. These 12 short teachings about how God's people have a call to give him wholehearted devotion, uh, to give wholehearted devotion to the way of Jesus Christ. There's three places in the book of James that kind of talks about how we use our words. And as we get into that, obviously, again, James 3 is that one that really stands out. But James 2, 1 to 13, talks about favoritism and love. James 2, 14 to 26 is the second teaching in this book. It talks about genuine faith. And again, the third teaching is about the tongue here in James 3, 1 to 12. The Bible Project says that how we talk about people opens up a window into our hearts and our core values. Our words tell the real truth about our character. Keep that in mind as we think about the things that come out of our mouths. So we're in James 3. We're going to start in verses 1 and 2. James 3, verses 1 and 2. Those verses say, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says... He is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. I recently heard the testimony of a pastor who said, you know, I never really wanted to be a pastor, and I can very much relate to that. There's a number of reasons I don't think being a pastor is very exciting. For one, it's, there's all kinds of physical inactivity, right? Um, another thing, when I was considering when I was talking about thinking about becoming a full-time pastor, I felt like there would be a loss of the genuineness of the ministry. In other words, now I have this awkward feeling of getting paid to do ministry, and so will people look at me and say, oh, you're just doing that because you're paid to do it. You're not doing it because it's actually coming out of your heart because actually Christ has made a change in your life. That's another reason I felt it was, it was weird to become a pastor. Um, also, of course, there's awkward situations and difficult situations and problems Problems that you have to work through with people. But I became a pastor because God's call seemed clear, and, and I um, reluctantly became one with perhaps some Jonah moments, and all of this is to the glory of God. But perhaps the number one reason of being not too excited about being a pastor is how James starts this out. He says that teachers will be judged more strictly I mean, that doesn't sound very good, you know? That doesn't sound like a position I want to be in. Um, and James' warning is that teach, the teaching of, his, of God's word is not for everyone. Um, but if you are one, you're called to be living well in obedience to God. And I'm telling you that some days are better than others for that. 
The qualifications for a pastor or overseer in 1 Timothy 3, 2, one of those qualifications is that that person is above reproach, above criticism, like not even opening oneself up to blame. And again, I, I fail here a lot. I'm just being honest there. The Reformation Study Bible talks about teachers in this way. It says that teachers exert influence over trusting students, a relationship that makes the students vulnerable to serious error. The teacher is held in strict account for what he or she teaches. The strict judgment should restrain teachers from careless words. The tongue of a teacher can be a a devastating peril. I don't know exactly why James 3 starts out with this warning to the teachers, but it might be just a reminder here for the teachers that they really need to be careful about what they say. I, if you've heard any of the news that's going on with Jerry Falwell, who was the president of Liberty University, that's a classic example. He has said and done some things that are very questionable, and in, being in his position, he's been called into account and called into question for the things that have allegedly taken place. I mean, that's a a classic relevant example right now of this very thing. But while it's these things about the tongue are true for the teacher, they're true for any human at all. Because we all stumble in many ways and, and we all are called to use our tongues in better ways. It's so true that we all stumble. We know that because we've countless times we've We've quoted Romans 3.23 that says that we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. James 2, earlier in this book, James says that if you stumble at one part of the law, in other words, you break one, you you sin one little way, you've broken the entire law. Romans 3.23, again, says that it's all of us. All of us have broke the law All of us have broken all of the law. We all stumble in many ways. There's no way with our fallen nature to be perfect. There's no way with our sinful nature to live a perfect life. But the text says here, if someone is able to control their tongue, if someone's able to never say a bad thing, that person's a perfect person. If a person is never at fault in speech, they're able to keep their whole selves in line. That's a crazy idea. Imagine being able to never say anything bad. But we know it's an impossible thing. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for it. James has made the point that when you control the tongue, you control the body. But he gives us some further examples to illustrate his point in verses 3 through 5. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Raise your hand, have you ever ridden a horse? Who's ridden a horse out there? Okay, yeah, that's a pretty, it's like half the group. I rode a horse in Germany named Max. And I remember learning about the bridle goes over the head of the horse, and that bridle has the bit connected to it, and when you pull on the reins of the bridle, the reins are connected to the bridle, the, the horse feels the tension and knows which direction you want the horse to go, but the bit is small compared to the horse. Ships, the second example James gives is ships. In Bible times, ships are not the same size as like this ocean liner here, but uh, if you want to know more about Bible time ships, talk to Gary Kling, he will, he will, tell, he will show you. Um, a Bible time ship, and how the fact that the rudder is small compared to the rest of that vessel, um, the small part of the boat or the ship controls the direction of the vessel. James also mentions a forest, and here he he says a great forest, so he's not talking about like a little grove of trees, he's talking about a, a big forest, and a forest filled with huge trees and all kinds of vegetation. But we've heard that song, It Only Takes a Spark to Get a Fire Going, right? Um, That's all about the Christian life, but 
it's true about a forest too. Just ask Smokey the Bear. He's, that's the reason he exists. It just takes a small spark, a match that, that falls away from somebody, a tiny little thing, all of a sudden controls this massive thing. The large thing is controlled by the tiny thing. So James makes the comparison, the tongue to the body, okay? I think we all know that our tongues are smaller than our bodies. The tongue in comparison to the rest of the body is quite small, but it speaks great boasts. Whether a person is big or small or tall or short, a person can be pretty influential by the things that come out of their mouths, by the things that they say, and how they use this tiny thing in their mouth. So that takes us to verse 6. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Two weeks ago, we talked about how, as gossipers, we can um, start fires with the things that we say about people, the, the rumors that we start. But you might think to yourself, well, fire can be good. Harold Martin said about fire, um, to, to relate it to this situation, he says, fire, when under control, is a great blessing to humanity. It drives the chill and dampness from our houses. We can use fire to cook our food. We use fire to warm our bodies. But when fire is out of control, it lets a path of desolation and destruction. Many of us are familiar with the Chicago fire that took place in 1817. It's a well-known fire um, that traditionally, and not for sure, but traditionally Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked the lantern over, you know, and it, and it burned the whole town down. Um, that's maybe another rumor, you know. Um, we don't know 100% what caused it, but it burned for three days. It killed at least 250 people. It left 100,000 people homeless. And in 1817, this is 1817, it caused $175 million in damage, damages, okay? Fire is all right, unless it's uncontrolled, right? Okay? The uncontrolled tongue is compared to a fire that destroys a forest, or as for Chicago, a city. Fire burns, it destroys, it leaves things as they were not before. Fire is painful, fire spreads, fire consumes, fire causes permanent damage. It's incredible to look at something that was beautiful before and is completely destroyed by fire after being burnt. While many parts of our body can cause us to sin, James calls the tongue a world of evil among the other parts of the body. People become corrupted by their tongue. That word for corrupted means like stained. They become defiled. You know, it'd be like wearing a, a beautiful dress with this like stain on it. And all you can look at is that stain that sits on it. Maybe a tuxedo that has a small stain on it. It just stands out. You might remember a Tide commercial from a number of years ago where a guy was doing a job interview and there was a stain on his shirt and the guy interviewing him couldn't focus on the interview because all he could stare at was the stain and the stain was talking. It's a very funny commercial. But that's what happens. We look at that stain. We're tainted by the things our tongue says. The Faith Life Study Bible says that careless speech can render a person unclean before God. So, so not only does it taint us, but in, before God, it makes us completely unclean. Remember, if we stumble at one part of the law, as James says, chapter 2, we break all of it. So there you go. Essentially, the tongue has the power to lead a person to eternal separation from God, to hell. The source of the tongue itself is also a fire. It says that the source of it comes from hell. Gossip and slander, as we've talked about in this series, is like setting fires. But we forget again that we too are in that fire, that we too can be set on fire by this tongue, this dangerous thing that is in between our teeth. 
as a bit controls the direction of a horse, as a rudder controls the direction of a ship, a tongue is a fire that controls the direction of a human. Jesus says it in Matthew 5, that words can kill. He says, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. By the way, that really is just a different version of the word fool that he's about to say here. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. It's just a nasty old thing that's sitting in our mouths, a wild, rabid, venomous little thing. So that takes us to verses 7 and 8. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So we know that wild animals can be tamed. I mean, kind of. Has anyone seen Tiger King? I mean, some of those weren't very tame. But it is amazing the ability we have to kind of tame an animal, but as you know, Even wild animals that are tamed, the wild still comes out of them from time to time. I mean, it's not recommended to tame a wild animal because eventually the instinct of that animal will take over. But even wilder than the wildest of animals is the tongue, a creature that Scripture says is untamable. No person can tame the tongue. Again, remember, verse 6 says it's a fire. Here it says the tongue is a restless evil. When were you the most restless in your life? Maybe a father pacing back and forth, waiting on the news of, of a newborn child that the wife is delivering. Kind of like being like a wild animal in the cage, just going back and forth, waiting to pounce. The tongue is restless that way, and it could strike at any moment. Isn't it so hard to keep our mouths shut sometimes when someone else is talking? And some of us have more restraint than others. But not only is the tongue restless and ready to strike, but the tongue, as the text says, is full of deadly poison. Think of a venomous snake. I'm going to warn you here for any of you who don't like snakes. I know there are some who don't even like to look at them. The next slide is about to have a snake on it, so don't look if you don't like snakes, all right? Reptilegardens.com says that the fierce snake, or the inland taipan snake, is the most venomous of any snake out there. It has a maximum yield recorded for one bite is 110 milligrams of venom. Venom. And that might not mean much to you, but 110 milligrams of venom is enough to kill over 100 people or 250,000 mice. This venom from the inland taipan acts very quickly. It can kill a human in as quickly as 45 minutes. I mean, it's incredible how quickly this venom from this snake can act. But I would venture to say that the poison of the tongue acts more quickly than the poison of that snake. Just like the toothpaste shows, it's instant, and you can't take it back. I mean, even if you do say you take it back, that permanent fire poison damage is done. Romans 3.13, in that passage, Paul quotes various psalms by talking about people who are using their tongues uh, poorly. Their, their throats are open graves. He's, he's really building the case for how humans are just sinful people. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. This little thing in our mouths is wild, all right? So James has established this, and Scripture says we can't tame it. So as believers... What are we supposed to do with this thing in our mouths? Let's look at verses 9 and 10. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. James mentions some inconsistencies here. 
I mean, here we are today. What are we doing? We're, we're here to praise the Lord. The hymns, the music, um, the graduations, uh, all of this is here for us to be able to praise the Lord. And this is good. This is a thing that the countless scriptures tells us to do, to worship the Lord. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. I mean, you get the idea. We are called to praise him. But this same mouth, the same mouth that is used to praise God, also curses others. And I'm not talking only about profanity here. This mouth curses other human beings that are made in God's image. And it doesn't add up. How can praise and cursing come from the same mouth? It appears that God takes that personally because these are his creatures that we are talking about. These are people that he considered worthy of salvation. We praise God and we curse men using that same mouth? I mean, perhaps the best solution is to, you know, as our parents maybe used to say, if you accidentally said something wrong or on purpose said something wrong, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. (laughs) But we'll see. There's a better way. There's a better way for us to purify our mouths. James reminds his readers that it should not be this way, and so he asks them two more questions in verses 11 and 12 to try to teach them about these inconsistencies. Can both fresh water and salt water, oh, yeah, that's right, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. It seems like James has taken a page out of the playbook of Jesus in using questions to teach the people. It's a great technique, and the obvious answer to those questions that he asks is no. If a spring has any salt water in it, it has to be a salt water spring. It can't be a fresh water spring. It can't be both fresh and salt water. And as Jesus said in Matthew 7, 16, we're going to know a tree by the fruit it produces. Fig trees produce figs. Grapevines produce grapes. Orange trees produce oranges. Apple trees produce apples. Pears produce pears. It's an obvious thing. So when these inconsistencies come and you have a fig tree that starts bearing olives, there's something wrong that's going on. There's something not right. And so we have to consider the source. If something is tainted that is coming out of the mouth, what's the source of what's coming out of the mouth? If something stinks that comes out of the mouth, there must be something that stinks where it's coming from. But even so, we live with these inconsistent mouths, praising and cursing, rinsing and repeating. My dad always said before he really came to know Christ, when the tires of our van would hit this driveway coming up for church service. He said he'd turn into a different person. Just like anything, though, my dad tried to fool everybody here. We can't fool God. We can't. We can try to fool all the people at church, but we can't fool God. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 15, 8 through 9, when he's frustrated with the inconsistencies of the Pharisees. And he says to them, by quoting Isaiah 29, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are are merely human rules. God knows where our hearts are. Even if we say the prettiest things we possibly can in church, God knows what we're actually thinking. He knows what our heart looks like, and he knows what we're saying when we're not around others. When considering the source, we have to consider that the heart is where it's at. Jesus says again in Matthew 12, 34 to 35, again referring to the Pharisees that provided so much frustration for him. He says, You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings up the good things stored up in him, 
and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. We have a problem because we have a nasty, wild, poisonous fire in our mouths that no man can tame. And if no man can tame it, well, that means all of our hearts are rotten and we need God. So if the heart is not close to God, the mouth isn't going to speak it. It's like when something crazy comes out of our mouths out of nowhere, it's kind of an indication of a wicked heart. We need Jesus in us to help us. When we accept Christ by faith and he lives in us, has built his home in us, as scripture says, it's kind of like we put a Jesus filter on our hearts that affects our hearts, affects how we view things, gives us kingdom thinking, kingdom mindedness. And it changes how God sees our heart and how our heart works and good things are stored up in us. So I have three questions for us as we apply God's word into today. And the first question is, who have you cursed? I know that it's happened to me before, and I'm sure it's happened to you, where someone's really frustrating you or annoying you, and you kind of start saying some bad things about them. And what happens? <laughs> they walk right into the room that you're talking to about. Talking, you're talking to somebody about them. They walk right into the room. You're quickly like, uh, how about them Orioles, you know? Um, now, don't be worried. If you ever hear me say, how about them Orioles, it doesn't mean I was just talking about you, okay? But, <laughs> but that happens, you know? Who is that person in your life that you have cursed, that you continue to curse? Do you not realize that that person is God's clay? God created them, not to mention, through faith, Christ died for them. Instead of cursing them, even if they frustrate you, pray for them. I think about when I worked at construction and I was at this lady's house and we were doing a project for her and she had been robbed recently. And, you know, I'm thinking about police reports and all this other stuff. And she said, oh, I was praying for them last night. And I thought, wow, it's amazing. She's praying for the person who completely disrespected her, broke into her house, and stole her stuff. After working on praying for those that you know and not cursing them anymore, how about we work on the ones that we don't know? You know, the, the bonehead driver or the idiot customer or that annoying person who cut in front of you in line. The second question I have is, is your mouth consistent? James pointed out that salt and fresh water shouldn't flow from the same spring, that a fig tree can't bear olives. How is your mouth at home versus church? Is there consistency there, or are you putting on a show? We have to recognize that even if the people miss our inconsistencies, that God does not miss inconsistencies. There was a church I was at one time, there was a meal after the church service, and this lady dropped her plate, and she screamed very loudly the S word. And, uh, and everyone's like, ooh, we didn't know she would say something like that. And you know, lots of times people are like, oh, don't you, don't you cuss in church. Don't you swear in church. Well, here's a challenge. How about don't swear anywhere? You know, sometimes people are like, well, I want to say something, but I shouldn't say it in church. You know, I shouldn't slander someone in church. Well, again, here's an idea. Don't you realize that God is everywhere? How about we don't slander people anywhere? There's definitely a, a pop culture um, um, idea out there that these are our bodies, and it's our choice to do what we want with our bodies. But that's unbiblical thinking because 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says that our bodies, it says the opposite. Our bodies are not our own. They were bought at a price. Therefore, we're supposed to honor God with our bodies. And so I take that to referring to the tongue as well as being part of our bodies. Let's be dedicated to using our tongue at all times for his glory. The third question I have is, what is your heart full of? Jesus said that out of the overflow, all right, think about overflow, of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, what is it that you're filling up with? 
Is it, if, if the only thing that you're filling up with is Netflix and Hulu and TV and podcasts or whatever, guess what's going to come out of the heart? Probably the things that we put into it. If we fill our hearts with scripture, guess what will come out? It's kind of like Turkey Hill, all right? I love their orange tea. I think it's really good. But did you know that their orange tea was an accident? Because one day the orange drink line, like, ruptured and leaked into the tea line. And they were like, huh, well, this is kind of a happy accident. Let's just go with that, right? I think it's a cool thing. But the reason orange tea leaked into it is because what was in that line was orange drink, all right? So orange drink, if a line's filled with orange drink, that's what's going to leak out of it. If we fill our hearts up with things of the Lord, that is what will leak out of us. And remember, we can't do this alone. We need him. So put on the filter of Jesus on your heart. If you don't know him as your savior, I would urge you to choose him today. Because we are in desperate need of a savior, there's no way for us to live a perfect life. And Jesus did live the perfect life that we could not and died on the cross for our sins. So please come up and talk to either Pastor Duane or, or I about it today, about the first step of having Jesus as a filter on your heart. But otherwise, if you do know Christ, I challenge you to put that filter on. Uh, may your heart be full of him. And watch how Jesus changes the things that you say. Will you mess up? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to mess up. But I assure you that less and less salt water will flow when we put that Jesus filter on our hearts. May we live for Christ in every way. He gave us his all. Let's give him all of us, including this nasty old tongue. Because he can calm the storm and he can tame the wildest of the wild. Amen. I'm going to pray, but there is one prayer request or a praise, I should say, that I wanted to mention and I forgot to, and that is that this week, Mr. John Brandt will have his 98th birthday. So we're excited for John as he turns 98, and I know that John would say he never expected to see a 9 and an 8 on his age, but we're happy for him and for the Brandt family as he turns 98 this week. Let's pray. God, we praise you for the gift of life. Uh, we praise you for 98 years for John Brandt. We praise you that, uh, that as we think about where we are at along the spectrum of 98 years, you know, we're probably either living for you or, or not living for you. And so I pray that you would work in us and, and challenge us to use every part of our body for your glory, including our tongues. Lord, may we, may we recognize this is more, this is not about, not, not only about swearing, Lord, it's about so much more, because we can swear in so many ways by not actually using profanity uh, in ways that tear people down and, and, and shoot daggers at them. Um, so, God, I just pray you would, would work in us and convict us of the sin in our lives and, and the negative ways we use this tongue and, and allow us to use it for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 499. If you're following along on the screen, the, the words will match up. But if you're looking in your hymnals, we're doing verses 1, 2, five and six. So the first two and the last two verses of page 499. If you want prayer for anything, if you want to know more about Christ as your savior, I'll be down front for prayer.
Oh, use me, Lord. Use even me. God will use us. He will. Uh, he's got a plan for all of us, you know. I mean, part of, part of looking at God as the creator um, involves the purpose that, that exists in our lives, that he had a plan for each of us that are staying in this room today to be born and to exist on this earth in the time that we are existing on this earth. So may the Lord use us, and may we use our tongues to lead others to him, to build people up, and to not tear them down. Amen.